get a mixed reaction. Okay, okay, I'll, there we go. Thank you, and good morning, everybody. It is wonderful to be here uh, with my family here back at Rocky Mountain Bible Church. Uh, my wife, Laura, is here today. I have six children, and actually we found out three weeks ago that we have another on the way. So you could pray for my wife, Laura. The doctors are telling us that we're kind of at a geriatric stage of our lives, so we would appreciate your prayers. Uh, uh, but my oldest daughter, Grace, had to leave after the wedding yesterday. She just got married last month to Thomas Klein, and he's preaching for me this morning at the little church that I uh, have been an interim pastor at for the last four years. But my wife is here, and then next down the line, my daughter, Faith. Joy is my daughter. Cherish and Delight. And then my son, Will, is here. So I hope you get a chance to meet them if you haven't done that so far. My last time to be here at Rocky Mountain Bible Church uh, preaching on a Sunday morning was three years ago. We were finishing up the Alive weekend, and it was the final session, and I got to be here on that day. And then since then, the Alive weekend has been happening at our campus, uh, Frontier School of the Bible in LaGrange, Wyoming. We're just north and east of Cheyenne, right on the Wyoming-Nebraska border, a little town of 372 people. And in that town, uh, there's a Bible institute that's been there since 1967. And I serve as the vice president at the school. I teach all the preaching classes for those who are going to go out as ministers, and uh, it's a great privilege for us to be there. Since last year's Alive Weekend, uh, we're so blessed because your church on October 31st, 2021, voted to bring our family on as missionaries of the church. And as a family, we're so grateful to have your partnership in our ministry there at Frontier School of the Bible. This church is very special to me. Going back to when I was a little kid, we would travel up here to see my Uncle Bruce and Aunt Donna, who years ago, Bruce was the pastor here. I know many of you know him, and now to have my brother-in-law, Pastor Mike here. There's been some special bonds here, and I thank you so much. I want you to know that as a church, you're one of a handful of churches in the nation that has really had a focused and targeted effort to support Frontier School of the Bible. For the last 30 years, you've assisted our school by sending us students from your church, by supporting our faculty and staff, many of them over the years. You have partnered with us on uh, missions trips to Africa. You have been gracious to let your pastors come and teach in several different capacities at our school. And uh, you're one of just two churches in the country that has a building on our campus named after your church because of all the investment that you have made at our school. I know it might be difficult to gauge the impact that your church has had on Frontier School of the Bible, but I do want you to know that it's been a major impact. And for all of us at Frontier, I'm standing today to just say thank you for your continued support of Frontier School of the Bible. If you're not familiar with the Bible Institute, we are a, a, like a tech school, a three-year tech school where you can come and get trained for ministry here in the country and all around the world. It's a focused training, three years, and you can come for one year of Bible school, and that one year costs $6,000. Uh, there's no other school that I know of in the country that you can attend for that price. The reason is everyone that serves there, from the president to those who serve in food service or our maintenance staff, everyone's there as a missionary. We are supported by local churches and individuals who allow us to come and serve there so that students can come for a short period of time, focus only on the scriptures and being trained for ministry, and then leave without any debt. And that's the philosophy of the school. I praise God for that Bible Institute philosophy. Bible Institutes got started in this country during the time of North America's Third Great Awakening. That kicked off in the 1850s. And right away, there were two Bible Institutes that took the lead. One of those very famous, still going today, Moody Bible Institute, was founded by D.L. Moody in 1886. The NIAC Missionary Training Institute, founded by A.B. Simpson in 1882. And when those schools got going, all of a sudden, Bible Institutes began to spread and explode across the North American continent. 
And during the latter two decades of the 19th century and first three decades of the 20th century, Bible institutes were all over the place. And the reason for that is they were the product of revival that we sang about today. That third great awakening sparked these institutions that would say, let's send missionaries to this nation and all over the world. They were sparked by revival. My family's had a long connection to the Bible Institute. Back in 1946, my grandfather, John Miles, felt led of the Lord to start a Bible Institute in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He served as its president there for 38 years, and people were trained there over those years to go all over the world serving the Lord. There were two men who came out of that school, uh, their names Richard Labar and Dan Johnson, and in 1967, they were both pastoring in Wyoming and Nebraska, and they felt like we need a Bible institute out west here in Wyoming that could do what our school did for us. They got in touch with my grandfather. He gave them all the curriculum from his school, talked to them about the philosophy and the purpose of a Bible institute. And in 1967, in this little cow town on the Texas Trail, Frontier School of the Bible, got started. I received my education there from 1990 to 1993. Your pastor was trained there just shortly after me. Uh, we met our wives there at Frontier. I know we're both very indebted to the school. But right now the word is out in many circles that the Bible Institute is just a relic. The dictionary defines a relic as being an object surviving from an earlier time especially one of historical or sentimental interest. Some people refer to the Bible Institute as a dinosaur, something that worked well in the past but now needs to move to the side and make way for more sophisticated approaches. Why stick with this approach, a tech school approach where students could come for very low cost, focus only on the scriptures for three years, and be prepared to serve God with their lives. Why stick with that? I remember my grandfather, who'd been a Bible Institute president, telling me that he always faced pressure as the president of a Bible Institute to expand, to diversify, to become accredited, to change their whole focus and philosophy. And we still face those pressures at Frontier today. But I am convinced that rather than being a relic, I believe that the Bible Institute is needed now more than ever. I believe that instead of being a relic, the Bible Institute is actually a resource for revival. I've seen it happen time and time again. Our students go out, they come to towns like Frisco, they go all around the world, and they've been trained in the Scriptures, able to disciple others, and I've seen revival that we sang about today happen in countless communities and places around the world because students came to a Bible institute and they were equipped to know the scriptures and to serve God well. And so I want to talk to you this morning about a commitment to a biblical education. But I'm not just talking about what we do at Frontier, although I'd like to say a few words about that. But what about you personally? Are you personally committed to a biblical education where you personally are going deeper in the Scriptures on your own, yes, supported by the local church, encouraged and equipped by the local church, but you personally, are you committed to your own biblical education? I sat in a wonderful Sunday school class this morning, and I heard the Bible being taught here at your church. Praise God for the commitment of this church to a biblical education. But I look out today at fathers and grandfathers, great-grandfathers, are we committed with our own families to really helping them with a biblical education? I want us to think about the reasons for that. When I was a freshman at Frontier, I don't remember the preacher who came, but a man stood up in our chapel and he shared a message that I've never forgotten. I wrote it down in my Bible that I had my freshman year. I was 17 years old. But he gave a message called, Why We Need a Biblical Education. I'm one that doesn't like to write in my Bible. I'm kind of OCD about writing things in my Bible. Nothing wrong if you do. But I wrote that outline in my Bible because I never wanted to forget it. 
And so I'm going to share with you today his outline, plus one additional point to the outline I'd like you to think about. Why do we need a biblical education? Why am I so thankful that as a church you're supporting a Bible institute where we train people in the Scriptures? I'd like to share a few reasons. And I think they're more than just sentimental reasons, more than just historical reasons I believe they're biblical. Would you turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3? This was referenced in Sunday school today. I'm so glad. But 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'll just point out some verses from chapter 3 and chapter 4. Why commit to a biblical education? Well, Paul makes it very clear in this text of Scripture, and I want to share with you four reasons why we ought to commit to that. If you're jotting down notes this morning, if you're a note taker, the first one you could write down is the condition of the world. Why should we commit to a biblical education personally in our families, in the local church, and at a Bible institute? Well, it's because of the condition of the world. Look with me at chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, and notice what Paul says in his prediction about what the last days will be like. He says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous, some of your versions may say, terrible times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why do we need a biblical education? Why more than ever do we need to ground ourselves in the Scriptures? It's because of the condition of the world. We are living in the last days. You know that biblically. The Bible teaches that the last days began with the ministry of Jesus Christ, And they will continue until he returns. And we don't know when that will be. We need to be ready. And Paul says there are going to be terrible times in the last days. When you think about the condition of the world, Paul is teaching us two facts about the condition of the world. First, they will be terrible times. That word that he uses for terrible means dangerous, hard to deal with, or savage. It's a word used in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 8, 28, that describes two demon-possessed individuals. They were savage, and the Bible says in the last days it will be savage times. Would you agree today that the times we're living in and the culture we're living in, that they are savage times? As I talk to people a generation older than me, I've heard them say time and time again, I never could have dreamed what I'm seeing happening here over the last couple of years. I never could have imagined that evil like this would be called good and that all that is good would be called evil like this. It's savage times and we shouldn't be surprised. Paul said, this is the way it will be. And sweeping through universities and schools across our country, here comes all of this teaching All of this philosophy and approach that says that whatever has been good, now it's evil. And what's evil is now being called good. And our children, our young people are being taught this. And it's sweeping across this nation and around the world. Terrible times. But Paul says, furthermore, another fact about the condition of the world. He says there are going to be these twisted teachers who will come along. That's what he's dealing with in verses 6 and 7. And they're going to gain control over people who are burdened with guilt. 
People burdened with guilt get pulled into these false religions. They're looking for escape from bondage and fear. And instead, they end up with more bondage and fear. And these false leaders grab people's loyalty and money and service. They take advantage of people's problems. And I think we all understand that this false teaching is spreading everywhere we look. At our school, Frontier School of the Bible, when you show up in your first year, you take a class called Bible Study Methods. How do you study the Scriptures effectively? You take a class on hermeneutics, the science of interpreting the Scriptures. The ladies take courses on women teaching women. I'm leading classes, uh, preaching classes, homiletics 1, 2, and 3. We have classes on introduction to Christian education, Christian education of children, a full year of doctrine training, two full years of theology training. Why? Because somehow with all the false teaching going out in the world today, we need those who will teach the truth, just like you're seeking to do here at RMBC. The one thing that will make a difference in this world and the sad condition of it is the all-powerful gospel message that God loved us so much He'd send His Son to die on the cross for our sins, to take care of all of our guilt and shame. And he died on that cross. He was buried, and three days later, he rose from the dead. He paid the penalty for us. He conquered death. He's alive. We've been singing to him this morning and worshiping him today. And that's what will change, one heart at a time, the condition of the world. That's how we make a difference. It's the condition of the world that should drive us to a biblical Education, But there's a second reason Paul gives, and that is the content of the Word. It is so important that we don't forget the power of this book we're holding in our hands this morning, or you're looking at on your phone. The Scriptures, the power within them, and Paul makes this clear, and I kept hearing about it in our Sunday school class today, and for good reason. Do you remember the content of the Word that you're holding? Look with me at chapter 3 of 2 Timothy Verses 15 through 17, the content of the Word. Paul writes here and says to Timothy, and that from childhood you've known the Holy Scriptures. They're sacred. They're set apart. There's nothing like them. Why? Well, notice what he says. Which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete. And I love this last phrase here of the chapter, thoroughly equipped for every good work. A lot of our students come to Frontier and they've been convinced that if you're going to be able to serve God well, that maybe you need a certain degree behind your name. Maybe you need to attend a certain institution that has certain prestige or glamour and be taught by certain teachers who have these degrees behind their name. But is that really the case? I know sometimes we fall into worldly wisdom that says, well, you've got to look right, have just the right training. But according to Paul, What gets one ready for service, what thoroughly equips you for the work of God, is this book, the Bible. He reminds us here of a few qualities of the Word of God, the first of which is, it is what steers us to salvation. It's the truth of the gospel and the Word that steers us to salvation. And if you're here today and you know that you'll spend eternity in heaven, it's because you heard truth from this book that steered you to salvation. But it doesn't just steer us, it will steer anyone who's willing to look at the gospel, consider that truth, and accept it by faith. It steers us to salvation. But not only that, it's the standard for our sanctification. Once you're saved, it's what helps you become more set apart, more Christ-like, more holy. It gives you doctrine. It tells you what is right. It reproves us. It tells us what isn't right. It corrects us. It tells us how to get right. And it gives us the instruction that tells us how to stay right. And eventually, if you keep immersing yourself in this book 
it totally renews and changes your mind to look at life and your family and money and work, all of it, through the eyes of Jesus Christ. And it's the only book that could do that for you. It steers us to salvation. It's the standard for our sanctification. And a third quality, it is the supply for serving the Lord. Doesn't matter what degree might be behind our name, what institution we went to, what faculty member we sat under. The key is, do you know this book, verse 17, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you believe this morning that the Bible is sufficient? for everything you need, for how to do marriage well, how to do family well, how to serve in the church well, how to be an evangelist well, that it will equip you for everything you need. Do you believe that? The Bible is the supply for service. Mahatma Gandhi, years ago, spoke forcefully to Christians when he spoke these words. You Christians have in your keeping a document with enough dynamite in it to blow the whole of civilization to bits, to turn society upside down, to bring peace to this war-torn world. But you read it as if it was just good literature and nothing else. Have we begun to treat this book as something less than what it really is? Why do we need a commitment to Bible education, biblical education, It's the condition of the world, yes, but it's also the content of the Word. I want to add a third reason that preacher who came my freshman year didn't have this in his outline. But the older that I'm getting, the more I see how important this is, and Paul speaks of it here in the text. The third reason for a commitment to biblical education is the continuation of the work. The continuation of the work. Somehow we have to get the next generation ready to do what we're doing right now. This past year, I saw three of my former teachers that I had at Frontier, men who were in their 90s or 80s. I saw all three men step into glory this year. That was difficult for me to watch because I always had the mindset, well, I'll just follow their example, I'll, I'll keep watching them, I'm glad they're taking the lead, but I'm seeing these men who taught me and trained me, now they're stepping into glory. And the scary realization is, now I'm the one who's supposed to be like they were when I was in school. I'm the one now who's supposed to be getting the younger ones ready, and that feels like such a daunting task, but for the Word of God. But we have to somehow continue the work. We are in the last days. And so notice what Paul says in chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Paul faced reality. These are his last words that he wrote in Scripture. And he knew that he had an ending point coming. So in chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. He knew the end was coming. He says in verse 7 of his service to the Lord, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. But what was he doing as he came to the end, as he came to that finish line, as he knew the departure was about to take place? What was he doing? He was training those who would take his place. This letter, you've been studying it as a church in Sunday school, we all refer to it time and again. He gave these words to that young pastor, Timothy, so he'd know what to do, how to serve, what focus to have. He gave him this because he knew, my departure is coming. And as I am quickly approaching my 50th year of life, I realize that just like my mentors above me, it went really quickly for them from the time when they were in the thick of it, on the front lines, training and teaching, to all of a sudden they stepped into glory, and it went very fast. And I know that will happen for me. And so I see these 18-year-old young men and women walk into our school, and I'm very burdened to ground them in the truth, because someone has to continue the work. I'm so thankful for a church like yours. I could give a number of examples, but I just think about the years that I've been at Frontier, You sent a young man named Chris Ouellette who was trained up in the Word of God and today I believe 
he is faithfully teaching the Word of God out in Utah as a leader at Fellowship Bible Church. You sent a young man, Charlie Endicott, who this morning is preaching a Bible message in Garden City, Utah. He got trained in the Scriptures to continue the work of God. You sent a young man, Ben Keller, who today is in Mesquite, Nevada, just faithfully teaching the Word of God to young people in that city. There's a young lady here today, Rebecca Willette, who is going to be very soon in the town of LaGrange, Wyoming, teaching the Word of God to young ladies there. I praise God. I could give many more names from your church. You've been doing the work of getting the next generation ready, but we cannot stop. And when they come to a school like ours, it's our passion and burden to see them prepared. Did you know right now in America, if we just take the pastorate, studies say that right now in America, there's just one in seven pastors leading congregations that are under the age of 40. Most pastors in America today leading congregations are over the age of 60. They're coming toward the end of the line. I'm getting calls from them all the time at the school saying, I'm about ready to hand it over to someone else. Do you have anybody that you can send us? I literally receive calls every week from pastors ready to hand off that baton to someone else. But there aren't enough young people to take their places. And so in the local church, in our homes, and at schools like this, we want to train, ground people in the Scriptures so we could continue the work. There's one more reason Paul gives in the text. Why do we need to commit to a biblical education? Yes, the condition of the world. Yes, the content of the Word. Certainly for the continuation of the work, for this next generation. But lastly, number four, because of the consummation of the work. We know a day is coming when the work will be consummated. It will be over. It will be completed. On the day of Jesus Christ, that work of the church is going to be over, and none of us know when that day will be. Notice what Paul teaches in chapter 4, verse 8. And if you know anything about the writings of the Apostle Paul, there was one day fixed on his mind. He couldn't get it out of his mind, and it shaped everything he did. And it's why he devoted his life to the only two things that are eternal, the Word of God and the souls of people. And the reason for that was he knew the day was approaching. Notice chapter 4, verse 8. He says, "'Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness.'" which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, capital D in my New King James Bible, the Lord will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved His appearing. What is that day, capital D, that he's referring to? It's the day of Christ. It's the day of Jesus Christ. It's the day that Christ Our bridegroom comes for his bride, the rapture of the church. That's the day. And on that day, the work will be consummated. By the way, if you're taking notes, I'll give you a few passages where Paul couldn't help but speak of this day. It drove him to help people understand the Scriptures. Here's some passages for you. Romans 13, 11 and 12. 1 Corinthians 1, 8. 1 Corinthians 3.13, 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, 2 Corinthians 1.14, Philippians 1.6, Philippians 1.10, Philippians 2.16, 2 Timothy 1.18, 2 Timothy 4.8. Look up those passages and become excited about that day. It's what motivates us now to ground ourselves in the Scriptures, make sure we're grounding others because the consummation of the work is coming. Jesus made an interesting statement when He was on earth, knowing that His own time of ministry here on earth was coming to a close, and then He would turn it to the church, to us. In John chapter 9, and verse 4, Jesus said these words, using that metaphor of day and night. Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. 
You know, the Bible writers often use that term, it's the last hour. It's the stroke just before midnight. The night is coming. The work is going to be consummated. Now is our time to be committed to this biblical education. Well, you are a local church that uh, has partnered with a Bible institute. And again, I'm so thankful for that. And you've been doing it for 30 years now. But how could you as an individual help the Bible Institute? We're missionaries serving there. You have other missionaries serving there. How could you help them? Let me give you a few practical challenges as we think about these reasons to commit to a Bible education. I get to travel all around the country and speak often to young people at Christian camps. And when I go, there is one challenge I give young people. I'm looking at a lot of uh, junior high and senior high young people today, college-age young people today. I, would, I, I give them one challenge, and that is when you get out of high school, would you sacrifice for the Lord one year of your life to commit yourself to a study of the Scriptures and only the Scriptures? Where the Bible is the only focus, would you give Him one year of your life I chose to do that when I got out of high school. I thought God was leading me to be a fish and game warden, but I went to one year at Frontier School of the Bible, and as I got immersed in the Scriptures, suddenly began, God began to stir in a different direction in a way I never thought He would, that I would become a pastor, a preacher. But what if you gave Him one year, young people, just to see what God would do with your life. And then go on to university, to college, to a tech school, to your trade, whatever it is. But what if you gave him one year? And to you parents here. I know back in the 40s when my grandfather started a Bible institute, back in those days, it was common for parents in the church to say to their children, go to one year of Bible school. It'll be so good for you. And then on to the rest of your life. I realize parents don't say that a lot in these days, but what if we did? What if they were strengthened before they stepped into the university where their faith will be attacked? What if they were strengthened before they stepped into that trade? What if they were grounded in the Scriptures in such an intense way? Couldn't that be a great thing for them? I'm saying that to my children. Give it one year. See what God will do. And maybe you could say that to your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandchildren. Many of you teach Sunday school here. You work at a live weekend. You work with a youth group. You teach children's church. You do VBS. Praise God for that. And when, when you're with those young ones, what if you said to them, have you ever thought about giving a year of your life to being trained in the Scriptures? I know of a school fairly close. You could go up there and be trained in the Word of God. I want to encourage you to bring your young people from this church to our Frontier Focus, our college preview weekend. You've been doing that. Tell others about it, too. It's always the last full weekend of September. This year, it's September 22 through 24. And they get a taste of what a Bible Institute is like as they come. Bring some people from your church up to Frontier to do a summer uh, work project as a missions trip to our school. Some of you have done that. Take one week to come up to the school. We have 47 buildings on our campus. We have a maintenance team right now of three individuals. By the way, would you pray? We need two full-time maintenance men soon. But maybe you could come with a team, men and women in the summertime, and help us with our buildings to be ready for a brand new school year and see what's going on there. Invite those of us who teach there to come speak to your youth group. This church has done that before with me to come speak at a youth retreat, at a gathering of your young people. We'd love to come and share with them. And then I appeal to you today, would you pray for Frontier School of the Bible? It's not a relic. It's a resource for revival. Something interesting that God is doing in Bible institutes and Bible colleges across the land, the trend, numbers-wise, at those schools is going down every year. That's just reality in our country. There's a moving away from things of God. But we have been so blessed at Frontier, and it's only the Lord. But for the last five years, whereas other schools are trending downward, God has graciously allowed us to grow just a little bit each of the last five years. He keeps answering our prayers, sending us more students to train. This year, for the first time in our 55-year history, 
we had the strongest retention rate of incoming freshmen now staying on for their second year, which is very intentional about getting people ready for ministry. We had an 80% retention rate that's never happened before. I'm excited there are still young people out there who want to serve God wholly and completely with their life, and God is sending them to us. So would you pray for us? Pray that God will send us harvesters to train. Pray that he keeps sending us more and more. And pray that we will always be faithful to the content of the word, just what it is in its purity and in its focus. Pray for the board and the administration, the faculty and staff of the school, that we will stand firm on the scriptures and never depart. All of us are familiar with that prestigious institution called Harvard. That school was founded back in 1636, and when it was founded, the original stated purpose of the college was this. Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. And therefore, to lay Christ in the bottom is the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. And they base that off John 17, 3. What an incredible purpose statement. Harvard was initially founded to train preachers, and they did a great job for a long time. But unfortunately today, that school has departed from those initial convictions and purposes Today, one of the most common adjectives tacked on in front of Harvard when speaking of religion is godless Harvard. In fact, unlike other, most other major universities, Harvard doesn't even have today a department of religion. Frontier School of the Bible was founded in 1967, and I praise God that it's never departed from its purpose to educate students in the Word of God and get them ready for life and for ministry. And would you please pray that that would never change until the Lord Jesus comes on that day for his church. I want to appeal to the leaders of homes that I'm speaking to today, the husbands and fathers that I'm looking at this morning. Remember that first and foremost, it's our job to educate our families in the Scriptures. Number one, that rests upon us. It's a wonderful privilege It's a holy calling. Men, take that challenge to educate your families in the Scriptures. To this local church, I praise God for the faithfulness to biblical education that you have had. Our school has benefited from that greatly. Don't stop what you're doing. Stick with the Scriptures. Support those who are doing it. And then I want to just say to all of us as individuals... While the local church is here to edify and to build up, and there are schools like Frontier there to assist, for all of us, it most of all, most importantly, is our responsibility to pick up this wonderful book every day and learn all that we can about it for all the reasons we've seen this morning. The condition of this world, the content of the Word, the continuation of the work, and the consummation of the work. For those reasons, we personally need to commit ourselves to a biblical education. I just want you to know, Rocky Mountain Bible Church, that what you do to pray for my family and support our work there means so much. I have to say, it has always been true, we see in the Scriptures, that wherever God is doing a great work, Satan is there to try to oppose. And I can say as a leader at the school, I've never seen a year quite like this one where we have faced such opposition from the enemy. And I could tell you the stories personally, but I just want to say we need your help in prayer because it has been an intense year where I've seen the evil one try to bring the school down with a number of tactics, and yet God is winning the battles, giving the victory, but we would ask for your prayers. And so I would like to pray right now for all of you and for that school And I thank you so much for letting me be here today and speak to you. Let's pray. Lord, here we are, a group of believers today that you've placed in this locality right now. And Lord, we've been sitting under your word this morning and we've been reminded of the reasons why it's so important to be educated in the scriptures. 
We realize that in Christianity today, there's been such a dumbing down in Christianity, a movement away from theology and doctrine. So many who say, oh, it's too divisive. Let's not even go there. But, oh, God, we have been reminded today of the reasons to dig in, to learn all that we can. The stakes are too high. The need is too great. And so I thank you for Rocky Mountain Bible Church, the stand that they have taken on the Scriptures, their commitment to teaching them and training up the next generation. Lord God, I pray your protection over this church. May it continue to be a resource of revival in Summit County and around the world as they support missions so faithfully. I pray that you'll protect Frontier School of the Bible. Protect all that we're doing there, God, to get people ready to be pastors and missionaries and camp workers and children's workers and faithful employees and employers and leaders of the church for the next generation. God, protect the school in every way. And Lord, I pray for us as individuals that we will see the Bible as the sacred book that it really is and be intentional about every day letting it renew our minds so that we approach every avenue of life, every phase of life, with the eyes of Christ, see life from His perspective, and then we'll see that what really matters, and the only two things that last for eternity, are the souls of people and the Word of God. And so may we be committed to those eternal realities, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much.